to see you all out this morning. I appreciate so much the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Uh, thank Brother Ben for that opportunity. And, uh, of course, remember them in your prayers this week. Uh, this is not going to be, we've got a huge problem, I see right now. I can't see the clock. But anyway, somebody flag me down when I get towards the end. No, this is going to be uh, 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 not necessarily one of those three-point A, B, C, and all the words start with the same letter sermons. Uh, I've never been real good at those. And this sermon has, has, has this, this, this message, this talk, this conversation, whatever it's going to turn out to be, uh, has, has been very difficult. Uh, for me, you know, I've had some t time to prepare uh, for, for speaking this morning. And, you know, usually somewhere along the way, uh, the Lord puts a thought in your heart or mind and that starts to develop. And pretty soon you figure out, well, yeah, that's that's the way the Lord wants me to go. Or, or no, it's not. Man, I'm way off base here, you know. And this 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 uh, message has been hard for me. And, I, and part of the reason... If maybe not all of the reason I've had such a hard time uh, with the message has been my spiritual outlook here of late. It has been pretty much like the weather outside. Dreary, damp, gray, gloomy. You know, it's not really hot out there today and it's not really cold, but it's uncomfortable. It's just, you know, it's just, I've just been in this kind of fog and haze concerning spiritual things. When we let ourselves uh, get that way, it's hard for the Lord to speak with us. Uh, it seems to me that our country is in serious trouble. That has been one of the things that has caused my outlook to be so gloomy. Uh, I'm, 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 this has nothing to do with politics. I, you know, uh, you ought to vote. I'll say that much. And, uh, but, you know, it seems to me that our country's in serious trouble. Our government has deteriorated into a tug of war of personalities and egos. It's not so much about the issues in, anymore. It's how much trash one of the parties can talk about the other party. They're, they're, this campaign, there's no essence to it. I'm not hearing what anybody stands on. I'm not hearing any thought out plans of how they plan to govern this country or address any of the issues. All I hear is how much they hate each other. And, and that's, that's just can't be good. You know, it's, we're left to wonder who's minding the store. A government made up of two parties requires by necessity in order to perform the business of government that the two parties are able to agree on solutions to the issues. Without that, the country can't be governed under this system. And they appear to be at an impasse. Neither side will agree with the other side, no matter what's proposed. It's not about the issues anymore, or at least it seems that way to me. We're, 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 our government is off track here. Our political system uh, is not as it should be, it seems to me. And I'm giving you my opinions here and the reasons why I've been and had such a gloomy spiritual outlook lately. Our system seems to be collapsing right before our eyes. Our politicians from the local level all the way to Washington can't seem to agree on anything. At least I've been feeling that way lately. And I haven't even mentioned the wildfires, earthquakes, hurricanes, violent protests, demonstrations that have resulted in rioting, killing, looting, burning, and then we have the pandemic. All of this taking place. I'm not looking at the rest of the world right now. I'm talking about this country, the United States, us. Our nation is in this state today. And, you know, it's hard to have a real cheerful, bright outlook when it seems like your world's crumbling around you. That the country that you love and have served is, is falling into decay. It, 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 and it doesn't seem like the people who are supposed to be able to help it out even know what they're there for. 
even how to do their jobs anymore. And I'm not talking about any one particular side. It's crazy on both sides. How can our country survive in the state it's in today? Then I think about the spiritual condition of the United States society, of us, of the American people. You know, what kind of shape are we in? Society openly practices sin while those claiming to be the church condone it. If you're offended by the truth of God, just find another church where they don't preach it the same. Our society seems to believe we ourselves can fix all the problems. If we just love enough, are tolerant enough, are generous enough, if we can learn to coexist, the problems will solve themselves. Now, honestly, I don't particularly have any problem with that last statement. I think, yeah, yeah, that formula ought to work, oughtn't it? So, you know, why doesn't it? Folks, because we're incapable of it. We cannot do those things in and of ourselves. Mankind, all of it, is under the curse. We all have this fallen nature. We all reject God and the things of God to some degree. Now, add to that the fact that the majority of our country probably doesn't even know God as Lord and Savior. I know all the polls say about 83% of us are saved. You can just believe all that you want to. It ought to show in how this country is governed and the laws of the land and the things we practice and how we treat each other. If we're 83% Christian, why doesn't it show on the outside? I don't believe it. I don't believe it lines up with the book. But, but all that, I'm giving you opinion. You don't have to agree with them. More power to you if you don't. But it's a dark time out there. It's, our country is, is spiritually bankrupt, it seems to me. I'm talking about society. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about the folks outside of the church. I'm talking about people who don't know the Lord. How can they love each other one, uh, uh, good enough? How can they treat each other good enough? How can they coexist well enough? You see America for what it is on the evening news if you can still stomach to watch it. With cities being burned and people hating each other and killings in the street. Turn on the local news. Listen to how many were shot in High Point last night in Greensboro and Winston-Salem. There's where we are today. Our society is in moral decay. It's a fact, folks. It's just there. I'm not telling you anything that you can't observe for yourselves. And, and again, uh, this is the mindset I've been in, like pretty dark, gloomy place. So then Brother Brian says, would you like to preach on the Sunday? I sure would, you know, but what am I going to say? You know, I, I don't want to be Jeremiah just up here and it's all doom and gloom. Give it up. The end's here, you know, but, but I let my mindset get in that place. And there's no denying the dark days we're in. You can't deny it. It's upon us, folks. And uh, uh, I forget the old passage in the Old Testament, but the lions in the street and the bears around the corner and the snakes in the house, something like that. We're, we're surrounded by all these evil things in our society today. Uh, society in general really is not interested in God. They have very little, if any, interest in God. They seem to think they can fix the problems themselves. We can get good enough to take care of fixing all this mess, so why bother with God? And folks, we know that's contrary to the Bible. Romans 3.10 tells us, as it is written, in God's Word, in the Holy Bible, in the inerrant Word of God, in that truth that you count on for the salvation of your soul, it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. If there's no self-righteousness 
among our society. How can we fix our problems if what we need is to love one another and to tolerate one another? We can't, can we? It's two opposite sides of a coin. We, we don't have the ability to do what needs to be done in and of ourselves. And it's becoming very transparent in the country in which we live in today. Yet, uh, uh, yet much of society today, believe mankind, can attain such a state of self-righteousness that we no longer need God. Many believe God is an old-fashioned idea that has no place in our modern society. The Bible has no validity for them, and because of this, the gospel is hidden from them. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, in whom the God of this world, you know who that is, don't you? God with a little g. He's called the God of this world. He's called the prince and power of the air. He's called the devil. He's called Satan. It says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. The Bible has no validity for them. They don't believe it. They don't even believe in God. And because they don't believe the Bible, and because they don't believe in God, it's impossible for the gospel to have any effect on them. Satan has blinded their eyes. I'm afraid that's where our society is today. We've prayed for years and years and diligent prayed and saints of old have done it we've done it revival Lord revival give us revival I can't count on both hands and all my toes the sermons I've heard if if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and do all the thing God requires I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land we've heard that over and over and over why haven't we had the healing? Because folks haven't humbled themselves and turned to God. I'm not talking about the church here. I'm talking about the nation. That passage applied to the nation of Israel. It did not apply to the church. The church, I'm getting ahead of myself, the church is not a nation. Don't misunderstand me. But the church lives in a nation. And we have responsibility to that nation. And we know God will judge nations. And so we have a right to be concerned and a responsibility to be concerned about our nation. And many have prayed for it for years and years and years. Lord, give us revival. But we don't see it, do we? It just, it just never seems to happen. Why? Because probably, my opinion, you don't have to agree with it, We've probably passed the point of no return. Our society, my opinion again, may have reached the place that so many are blinded to the gospel and, and to the light of Jesus Christ and his word that there can't be a national revival and therefore a national repentance. The verse that I just quoted to you, uh, uh, that God speaking to the nation Israel, if, if my people who are called my name, called by my name will do all these things, I will heal here and I will heal their nation. Again, that, that verse was, a, that was directed to the nation of Israel and, and the church is definitely uh, not a nation. But again, we live in this nation and if this nation will do what God requires. He can and will heal our land. I'm convinced of that. But it's going to require national repentance. Israel had to nationally repent of their sins for God to take his judgment away from them. An example, and then i got to get back to my notes. An example is Daniel. 
Daniel prayed for the nation. And, and Daniel was willing to confess uh, himself as a sinner among the nation. He, he prayed, Lord, we have committed these sins and we have done these things. And Lord, heal us. He, he, heal the people. Heal the land. And so we have a responsibility. We're, 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 we're not, uh, we are the salt. We are the light. We have a responsibility to be those things to this nation, and we ought to. But that doesn't mean the nation will listen, does it? And eventually, we're going to get to the place to where uh, we, we've passed that point. Maybe we're there. We're there. I'm not sure. Uh, my, my mindset of late seems to surely indicate that. All right, then I consider the spiritual condition of the church, a little of which I've already alluded to. Jude, verse 4. This is Jude speaking of apostasy within the church, the confessing church. I'm not talking about the nation here anymore. I'm not talking about a country of unbelievers. I'm talking about the church here. Jude says, For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, this happened in Jude's day. There was already apostasy in the church. It was alive and active then. Guess what? It hadn't got any better. It hasn't healed itself. It, it is worse now than it has ever been. That's not my notion. That's what the Word of God tells us. Jude goes on further in verse 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the game saying of Korah. These are some of the things that manifested themselves in the church in Jude's day due to the apostasy that was in the church at that time. And the things he's talking about here, gone in the way of Cain, that's living selfish lives full of hate. That's what Cain did. After the heir of Balaam, Balaam hired himself out several times to curse the night. Yeah, I'm a prophet. I'm going to get God on your side. A little under the table here. I'll go over there and curse them people for you. The heir of Balaam using godliness for personal gain. And then perished in the gain saying of Korah. Korah was a fellow who just decided, well, he ought to be the priest. He ought to be in there having a part in it, taking a part in it. False prophets. They intrude into holy places. All that was going on in Jude's day in the church. Then we look at the spiritual spiritual condition of the church in the United States today. You know, uh, Paul also spoke of apostasy within the church and tells us it will only become worse until there's hardly any distinction between the lifestyles of society and those that profess to know God. He tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, this know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fears, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, High-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. He said, well, it's a crowd all outside the church, isn't it? Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Folks, he's describing the church. What would happen to it eventually? if I understand the scriptures correctly. Yeah, all those things take place out there in the world, but the world doesn't offer up. It doesn't try to convince you they're godly, do they? 
They, they don't have a form of godliness. They'll stand up on 6 o'clock news and deny God. And, and, and last week, just, just a man cursed God with the most foul language on public TV. I mean, no, they don't have, we're not talking about the world. The world doesn't have a form of godliness. The, God never tells us to stay away from the world. He tells us to stay away from worldly things. He tells us not to get caught up in the things of this world. But God never de- directs us to turn our attention from the people who make up the world, which is lost around us. But here God tells us to turn away from those. We're talking about people within the church today. And I believe that he goes on in verse 13. Paul still talking to Timothy, his beloved son in the Lord. But evil men and seducers so wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. There are several times that I wonder when I listen to the evening news, now how can that be so? How can people be that stupid? I mean, that is so dumb. How in the world could anybody fall for that? How could anybody believe that? And this verse comes to my mind every once in a while where they're deceived. You know, they're incapable of understanding the truth anymore. They're deceived and they're being deceived and they are deceiving others. And, and this, I'm afraid it takes place in society, but I'm afraid a lot of it takes place in church today. Also, I find it interesting and concerning to read or listen to the recordings of preachers and teachers of yesterday, those that have already ran the races. I've recently been listening to Dr. J. Vernon McGee teaching from the book of Jude, which deals in part with apostasy in the church. For those unfamiliar with McGee, he had a well-publicized break with the Presbyterian Church in 1955 after he charged that the church's liberal leadership, quote, has taken over the machinery of the presbytery with a boldness and ruthlessness that is appalling, end of quote. And McGee separated himself uh, from that group, claiming Uh, all the things that all Christian groups claim. Although he died in 1988, his teachings on apostasy, his teaching on apostasy is as relevant today as ever. He predicted, and I'm not lifting the man up here, but he predicted, and I suppose you might use the words foretold or prophesied, certain events that are taking place today over 30 years after his death. God's word doesn't change, folks. If God said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And, and the timing may can be affected. Uh, I'm revi- reminded of Nineveh, which God had, had, had purpose that he would destroy if they did not repent. And they heard, and they did repent, and more time was given them. But Nineveh eventually perished. You can't go to the city of Nineveh today and find a bustling, thriving community. Uh, God's word will take place as God said it would take place. And now again, back, back, back to McGee. And again, I'm not lifting the man up in any special way, but he understood that if certain things did not change in the society of his day, they would certainly lead to certain events or situations. And he did not live to see some of those events or situations take place, but they are indeed taking place today. The point of all that, uh, God's word doesn't change. God's word is truth. Truth sometimes can be pretty harsh. Now, a lot of what I'm saying this morning is my opinion, and I'm not telling you that you have to agree with my opinion, but I am telling you God's word is the truth. 
Now, you may have a different understanding than I do, but God's Word is God's Word, and we ought to be able to come together and reach some type of agreement on what it says. And again, uh, maybe I'm a little harder this morning than I need to be, but it sure looks like dark days to me. Uh, some well-respected mainstream preachers, teachers, and scholars of today believe that God is judging our country. Let's look at that list again. A government divided in a way never seen before. Wildfires, earthquakes, hurricanes, violent, deadly protests and demonstrations, rioting, killing, looting, burning, and the COVID pandemic. And so many men, people, Christians, uh, teachers, preachers, evangelists are beginning to say, that without question in their minds, the United States is under the judgment of God. And you don't have to agree with that. But I will tell you this morning, I'm, I'm leaning very strongly that way. You know, how can all these things be transpiring in our country? Uh, and if God is pleased with us, if, if, if everything's okay, if, if it's going to be all right on down the road, I just, I just have a hard time accepting that. And I wonder, has our country provoked God to anger as the nation of Israel did? We find two different instances in the scripture in which, uh, uh, well, I'll quote two. There are more than two. There are at least four in which Israel drove God to anger. And we find the first one in Deuteronomy 32, 21. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. God became angry with Israel. And he judged Israel. We find in 2 Kings chapter 21, the 15th verse. Because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger. Since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt, even unto this day. So God put up with Israel and all their aggravations and shortcomings, but there were times when he got angry with Israel and he judged Israel. Uh, the, the whole book of Judges is a continuous cycle of God uh, judging Israel for their rebellion. They would turn from God, they would get into ungodly things and ways, and God would judge them by sending a nation to conquer them and put them into subjection. Israel would get so sick of that, they'd turn to God, and there would be national repentance, and God would hear, and he would heal their land, and things would get going good again, and Israel would turn from God. And it repeated itself, and it repeated itself, and it repeated itself. I, don't hold me to this, but it seems like the number 20 is in my mind. That maybe there are 20 different times, but don't hold me to that. But it is over and over and over again. So Israel angered God often. And now we as a church are not a nation, but again, we live in a nation that I think maybe has angered God. And I think God is maybe judging this nation. It's not unusual. God will judge all nations. Every nation with the goats and sheep, those that followed God, those that didn't. I mean, this is not an unusual thing. That, not an unusual thing that God would, would, would judge. He's done it many times with Israel in the past. Uh, the great flood. Only eight persons. The entire human race was wiped out in God's judgment. So don't get the notion in your head that God's looking the other way. And God doesn't judge. And the United States is going to get away with all this somehow or another. You know, folks, just, I just don't believe it's going to happen. I don't know any prophetic scholar of any time period who has been able to find the United States in the very end days. In the book of Revelation, when we get to Armageddon and all those 
mysterious, wonderful things that we read about and can only half understand. Nobody's been able to find the United States there anywhere. I'll go ahead and name one name, Dr. David, David Jeremiah, in one of his latest books, the book of science, says that he believes the United States will not be there because they are destroyed due to their own moral decay. And he believes, this is his own words, published in his own book, that we're there. That there's no turning back for the United States. That we'll be judged, that we'll collapse, that we'll eventually destroy ourselves if God doesn't do it for us first. That's really a dark, gloomy message to stand up and preach on a dark, gloomy day. And, and I've got other things I could say here that are just as dark and just as gloomy. But I've got about all of it I can stand, and I guess you probably have too. So, so let, me just, let me just ask the question, will the United States repent? If the United States repents, I assume, I have no reason to believe otherwise, that God won't always do what he's always done with a nation that would repent, that he would forgive them and heal them. So the question becomes, will the United States repent? I don't have the answer for that, folks. I, I don't know. I hope so. Some of the televangelists, like Dr. David Jeremiah, uh, 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 many, many others, uh, uh, the devil, uh, well, I don't know if it's the devil or not, but every name just flew out of my head. But people you would know if, if, if I gave their names. And men like uh, Dr. Jeremiah will remind us it's our duty to pray for our nation, but many of them believe that, that, that we're too late for a national repentance. But there's still folks out there that'll hear the word. There's still individuals out there who will accept the message of Jesus Christ. They're not all blinded. They haven't all gotten to the point that, that, that they just reject God outright. You know, We still have a ministry. We still have a work to do. Uh, so what are we to do? Well, we're to keep serving God for one thing. We're not to let ourselves get in the place that I got to. And yes, it got to the place that, yes, I didn't have an idea up until yesterday just before lunch what I was even going to say today. And I finally forced myself. I have this beautiful little prayer garden at home. I took a lot of time to, to, to design it and lay it out. I carried the rocks from different places on my little patch of property up there and I laid them out just in this particular design. And I've got other little rocks that I'll write prayers on uh, the peace of Israel. God bless America. And, and, and all these. And it's just a gorgeous little place. And I spend practically no time there. All the hours I put in, I'll pass by it. I'll see it when I'm mowing the yard. Man, that looks, I really need to get a word to spend some time there. You know, that'd be such a sweet place to meet with God. But I'm so busy, and I'm caught up in so many things, and I'm doing so much, and I'm worried about so much. And part of me says, what the heck's the use? You know, it's, it's, it's all crumbling around us anyway. Why even bother to sit back and wait for the Lord to come and get us whenever that is? You know, but... Yesterday, I forced myself to go and sit there in the garden for a little while. And I forced all these thoughts out of my mind and all these fears and all these anxieties and all these things that had been pestering me for so long. And I just got up against God. God, what do you want me to say? And God spoke to my heart. You're a mess. You know that. <laughs> Have you forgot I'm God? Have you forgot no matter how dark the day gets, I am the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. I'm your salvation. I'm your hope. I'm your way out of here. And as long as I have you on this earth, you are a part of my plan. And I have something for you to do. Get unbusy. Spend some time with God if you want to have the peace of God. You can't be at peace with God if you don't spend some time with God. And time is the hardest thing in the world for us to manage, isn't it? This fallen nature we have, 
I'm a child of God. I'm, I'm adopted into the family. I'm an heir of the kingdom. God loves me enough that he went and died on the cross for me. God has blessed me beyond all belief. I've never been to where I didn't have food to eat. I've never had clothes on my back. I've never not had a shelter over my head. God has so wonderfully and mercifully looked after me. God has cured me of the sin nature I was born with. And He has restored my soul. And He has put my feet and my heart on a path to Him. Yet, I won't take time to spend five minutes with him because I'm too busy. How many times does God speak to our hearts? I need to talk to you a minute. Well, I, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. I got to run over here just a little while and then I got to go over there just a little while. And Lord, you know about this right here. This can't be put off. I got to do that. You know, aren't we all guilty of that to some degree? You know, and if we aren't careful, it gets to be that Everything is time except God. Oh, you might pass him once in a while during the day. Hey, hi, God, I see you over there. Thank you for this sandwich I'm about to eat. Or, you know, well, Lord, it's been a good day. Look after me tonight while I sleep. And then we get up in the morning. Well, another morning, Lord, thank you for that. If that's all the conversations we have with God, folks, we can't be at peace. We can't know the peace of God. We can't even be at peace with God. You know, and, and God spoke to me. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to close out here, and I've I'm, I'm, I'm got several more pages here. It all says the same thing. Uh, basically, you know, God, shh, that's just how he spoke to my heart. Now, the things that take our time, we've got to make time for God. The scripture tells us, uh, James 4 and 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. You can't get close to God without taking the time to get close to God. It doesn't happen automatically just because you want it to. I want to get up at 5 o'clock every morning and I want to spend an hour with God before I even start my day. I want to do that. I would enjoy doing that. I wish I could do that. But unless I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, it's not going to happen. It doesn't happen automatically. Draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. Stay where you are, and God stay where He is. You know, it's like that old joke, the man and woman married 25 years ago out on their anniversary. The wife almost in tears. Oh, I remember when we used to sit so close together and snuggle while you were driving down the road. And he looks over and says, well, honey, steering wheel's in the same place. You know, she's the one that moved us that way with God. You know, we, we have to draw nigh to God if we want that special communion with God. And you can't make it in this world without him. We simply can't do it. Uh, so, so how do we have peace and no fear of what lies ahead? And I'm going to finish up with these few little thoughts here. First, 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, I think if you do the first part of that verse, the second part of that verse happens. The first part of that verse is but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Do we take the time to do that? You know, when the disciples ask the Lord, teach us how to pray. The Lord gave them the example of a perfect prayer. And one of the very first things they were supposed to do in that prayer was to hallow God. Our Father which is art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You need to hallow God in your heart. And, you know, this is something you don't do it once and it's over with. You know, it's, it's the word hagiadso. And it means to make holy. You have to make God holy in your heart. God is holy. He's always holy. He's always been holy. He's always going to be holy. That's not what it's saying. It's saying make God holy in your heart. Make Him live in your heart. 
when the gloom and doom comes, see God in it. Be close enough to Him that we're not uh, 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 forced into fear. You know, uh, it, that type of thing. We have to make Him holy. To make Him holy in our hearts, we're going to have to make time to make Him holy. We're all far too busy. But in all that busyness, we have to find the time. It will not happen just because we want it to happen. It's not an automatic process. In fact, it is contrary to our fallen nature as well as our busy lifestyles. Knowing all, and I didn't bring that point out, I don't think I didn't conclude it, you know, all this that we want to do, getting up with the early prayers and all like that, all those things that we wish uh, we did for God, uh, again, you know, they it's, it's contrary to our human nature. You know you're a child of God. You can know your strength comes from God. You can know your strength comes from prayer with God. You can know your life is not going to be nearly as good if you don't stay close to God. And the Holy Spirit will say, come spend a few minutes with me. And we'll say, I'm busy. And we don't take the time to spend with God that we should. And folks, I'm not preaching to you from some high horse. Oh, I've ever been able to do, you can call it preaching, preaching if you want to, God calls it foolishness, but all I've ever been able to do is just share what God has shown me. And, and the Bible tells us, at least in one instance, that we're all kind of alike. We all kind of share the same passions. We've all seen some of the same troubles. So I figure maybe if I've gotten myself in a bad way and God's shown me how to get out of it, maybe you're finding yourself drifting down that same path and maybe something that God has said to me that I have shared with you will help you. The last things, I'm just going to read a few verses here. Uh, if anybody's interested in any of this, I, I can give you notes. But again, I've already said James 4 and 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. It's going to take time. That's how you make him holy in your heart is spend time with him. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself proof unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to get the book. You're going to have to spend some time in the word if you're going to have peace with God. If you're going to be able to walk through these difficult times, you know, eat without national repentance, without some type of revival in the church that will change our nation, it's not going to get any better. Paul said there would come a time when evil men's hearts would wax worse and worse. And eventually every thought they had would be evil. You know, there's some dark days ahead, folks. Now, I'm not telling you they're tomorrow. I'm, I'm, I'm not telling you when they're going to happen. Nobody knows but God. But apart from people turning back to God, I don't see us recovering from this downward spiral that we are in. So if we're going to have to live through this time, as Christians, we need to know how to do it and keep God holy in our hearts so that we don't get all beat up like I have been here lately. And part of that will be studying the Word of God. Then we go... Uh, I didn't write chapter and verse down, but it's Hebrew somewhere. Not forsaking the assembling in ourselves together, as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Talking about the day of the Lord's coming. Our fellowship with each other is very important in this time. Do you know when the church is separated like it is now? Uh, you know, we, we, it, I feel fragmented. I don't know whether any of you feel that way or not. I, I miss the Sunday school classes. I miss the time talking before the service and the time talking after the service. I miss the meals over at the fellowship hall. I miss doing the events that we did together. You know, All those things are wonderful and great, and I love doing all of them. But the most important part of it, the thing that will help us get through some of these dark days that we are facing now and may even get worse in the future is our fellowship with one another. And we lived in a day that's blessed in a way to have all the technologies we have. We not, may not be able to meet like we would like to meet, but we have a way of communicating with each other. We have a way of staying in touch with each other. You know, somehow I can't help but think that if, it's, if we are at a place 
to where we're about to come to some conclusion, either the conclusion of this country or maybe the conclusion of the days of the Gentiles. But if we've come to a place in the scripture to where there's about to be some type of drastic change, the saints need to be in touch with each other. We need to be fellowshipping with each other. We need to be drawing strength from each other. We need to be sharing the things we're going through with each other that we may give one another strength. And I can't get it out of my mind how this pandemic has prevented us and is still preventing to a certain extent us doing those things. You know, if, if Satan were about to put his foot down and think he's about to do something big here, you know, this is his chance. He's going to step on the scene. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he could bust the believing church up? He's already got the ones that don't believe. You know, they're deceived and deceiving others. They just claim to be Christians. They've just got a form of God in this. What about the real church? What about the real believers? You know, he kind of need to give us a little punch too, didn't he? And it looks like maybe he has. Don't forget to assemble yourselves together. Now, it may not be like it used to be, but be sure you're talking to one another. Be sure you're sharing with one another. The scripture says, I believe the scripture says, no man is an island, but we, we need each other. And, and don't let yourself get in a place to where you're separated more than you have to be. I realize it may be, maybe I have done that. Maybe that's part of my mindset lately. Now, I'm not telling you to throw caution to the wind during this pandemic again. Don't, don't get me wrong. You can fellowship on the phone. You can find a way in this technological age to stay in touch with your brothers and sisters and have fellowship with them. All right, then it says, the last thing I'm going to part with you is Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known unto God. So be careful for nothing. Be anxious. Don't be anxious over anything. Now, doesn't that sound lovely? You know, how do you watch the six o'clock news without getting anxious over something? How, how uh, do we run through this busy life and not get anxious? You're going down the road at 60 miles an hour. Somebody pulls out the driveway in front of you. You know, there, there's all kinds of things to be anxious about. It appears our country's falling down around us. Don't be anxious. You know, Lord, what, you know, come on, what is it? Then get into all the health concerns. There's so many of us in this church that have health problems. Don't be anxious about your health. How can you not be anxious about your health, you know? And, 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 and all these things that we face, many of them, I'm convinced, uh, uh, will draw us away from God if we let them. We, 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 but we have to find a way to give these things over to God and to end the anxiety part of it. We have to resign ourselves to, to God. God's still in control. He, he's, he's, not, he's not slipped up. Uh, I guess probably, and I, I, I hesitated whether to say this or not because of some of the situations in the church today. But as far as health problems, you know, my goodness, just look around this little congregation, you know. We've had transplants and parts replaced and, and you know, we've had back surgeries and leg surgeries and shoulder surgeries by the dozens. And just uh, doctor's appointments, you probably couldn't, you know, probably take any month out of the year you want to and we can put somebody down for every day, it seems like. And then the big one, let them throw cancer on you. There is something about cancer that I, from my experience, maybe everybody doesn't experience the same thing, that just shakes your faith to its foundation. It's like somebody's grabbed hold of an apple tree and is shaking it to get every apple to fall off of it, you know. And, and, and the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. That I'm not supposed to be anxious over that, you know. And... I think sometimes, you know, we, we let those things overwhelm us because they are things that will make us anxious. But again, if we can just get along with God, let him snuggle up to us, 
put his arm around us, say, I got this. I knew about this a long, long time ago. And it's going to be okay. I done figured out what's going to be the best here. I've had this plan since before I created the earth, and you were a part of it. I know exactly where you're going. I know exactly what's going to happen. And it's all according to my will. If we can get to that place, then these dark days like I've been experiencing won't be near as dark. You know, it really, if we can get to the right place, kind of exciting. You know, we may be fixing to go home. We, we might be fixing to leave out of here, you know. And, and if it drags on for another few years, we're the ones that have the answer. And there'll be some folks that'll want to hear, how, how, how do you get along so good during all this? You know, why, why doesn't it shake you to your foundation? You know, and we'll be able to witness and we'll be able to tell people about Christ. But only if we can live the way God wants us to live and not get all caught up in these things. Now, uh, I'm going to close with that. And uh, as Donna plays the invitation on him, I, I'm, I want to say this. You know, I've been speaking primarily to the church here. But you may be here today and you've never accepted the Lord as Savior. Maybe you're one of those that, that, that just have never been real sure about your salvation. You know, the, folks, there's some dark days ahead irregardless what happens. Guess what? No matter which party wins this election, the country's not going to be okay next week. These things are not going to straighten themselves out instantly no matter which party gets in. We still have dark days ahead at best and we're going to go through some mean hateful things you don't want to go through what lies ahead without knowing God is your Lord and Savior we need to make our calling and election sure we're told in 2 Corinthians last reading 13 5 examine yourselves whether you be in the faith Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. Well, what, what I think Paul is saying here to the Corinthians, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. There have been deceivers since the early church. That it, it's Being saved is just not recognizing that there was a Jesus and that he lived about 2,000 years ago. And there was a book written, you know, and it's the Bible and it's God's Word. You know, you can believe all those things and still not have accepted Him as your Savior. The Scripture tells us that the devil knows and believes and trembles. So just to know there is a God, that doesn't get it done. You have to be sure that you have a personal relationship with Him, that you have accepted Him into your heart. Prove your own selves. <coughs> the best way to do that is ask yourself, when did it happen? You may not know the exact date. You may not know what day of the week it was. But there ought to be a time that sticks out in your mind when you got serious with God and God got serious with you. I don't, I don't know what day it was. Uh, I don't know what month it was. I'm not real sure what year it was. I know it was the second time I had come to the Lord and asked him to save me. But there was a change took place that second time. There was something that happened. I could tell you exactly where I was. I could tell you exactly how it felt. I uh, bent my head over the steering wheel of an old beat-up pickup truck I had and said, God, I'm done with it. I've had it. You, you, you're going to have to take my life. Take this mess and make something out of it. Come into my heart. Heal me. Forgive me my sins. And set my feet on the right path. In some form or fashion, you have to have done that. You have to have that, that place where you know you did business with God. And God did business with you. I encourage you today, if you don't know that, don't leave this service without settling in your heart. Dark days ahead. I don't see how anybody will be able to make it without our Lord Jesus Christ. That's all I have today.